We're in day two. Welcome back to another day here at the shop. It's good morning. Good morning, Richard. I'm going to get behind the camera. We're going to follow him around again today because I know y'all don't want to see me. So uh, let's check out what happens today. Stick with me. So I have an even treat oven, um, but some people that are starting out don't. So I've done my tempering in a toaster oven with a separate gauge to make sure the temperature is good. I've also done it in my wife's kitchen oven. From there, uh, she just complains a little bit about any leftover oil residue that smells up the oven. So I'm going to turn off our oven, pull the part out, the rack will come with it, put it up on top of the oven, close it. And now I'm going to go put this in a vise. Let it air cool for about 10 minutes. Okay, so the blade is now cooled down to just about hand temperature. And let's go find out how hard it is. So this is a Rockwell tester. I bought it back when I was doing a lot of stock removal knives. But how it works is we're gonna take a diamond point on this tester, bring it down to the work in an area that's gonna get ground away and I'm gonna apply a certain amount of weight. I'm gonna first set it up to um, top dead center. And I'm gonna apply a certain amount of weight to it. And that diamond is gonna go into the work just a little bit. Now that the diamond's sunk into the work a little bit, I'm gonna take and I'm gonna apply the second weight. The second weight makes the diamond go farther and the distance between the first weight and the second weight is measured and turned into a rock wall on the scale. Now my goal was rock wall 60. 6061 mm -hmm. and right now that is right on the button of 60. So we're doing the double temper the way I do it and doing the temperatures the way I do it mm. yielded exact results. This is a something you don't need. Uh, people use files to check their hardness. Yeah. Uh, but I've been in the machining business for such a long time I'd rather have something that tells me exactly what it is mm -hmm. uh, than um, I guess well, a, a good educated guess with a file. Now we're gonna go on to uh, grinding this finish. The blade is probably about a thickness of a dime right now on the cutting edge. I gotta reduce that down to, oh, very little. Um, set up to do some grinding. The first grit I'm gonna use is gonna be 60. By holding the Ricasso in a vise, I see that the blade is centered on the other end of the two jaws. Mm -hmm. And to make sure that the vise is not causing it any issues, I hold it in the vise and the blade is centered in the other end of the two jaws. So this is actually a pretty straight blade. Again, the vise can do a little scissoring, sure. throw you off, so check it on for both sides. And if you have a twist in it, it gets a little bit harder to understand what's going on, but I can see yeah. twists when that happens. Mm -hmm. So the blade is down to about a little bit more than a 64th of an inch thick. I got a little more grinding with this grit and then I'm gonna go refine it out to 400. Right now the blade is at 110 grit finish. Mm -hmm. um, I've stopped here because when I hardened this blade, I hardened up the tang. And I like to get it softened down halfway through the ricasso or partway through the ricasso so that when I go to file these corners and I file them, I don't belt sand them, um, my file can cut this. Because mm -hmm. right now it's too hard at Rockwell 60, it's too hard for my file to cut. Yeah. Or my how, file, file would dull out quickly. How do you draw down the Rockwell? Okay, I'm gonna grab a set of um, uh, propane torches mm -hmm. and I'm going to blue it again we mentioned before when I'm grinding that if I blew a blade while I'm grinding I'm yeah. taking the hardness out well I'm gonna take the hardness out of the uh, uh, back of this knife mm -hmm. with the torch I see 
and uh, I set a set, set of aluminum set of drawers in. I'll grab this. As a heat sink, so it doesn't yeah, get exactly. hot where you don't want it to. It still gets hot where I don't want it to, so I'll use a rag. Yeah. But uh, this will keep a lot of it from happening. Sure. And I'm going to come around here, grab this. I'm going over here to get a uh, couple of torches. Trying to keep my cutting edge from getting too hot. Yeah. Okay. I got that blue down to about there. I'm a little more towards there. Again, this has to cool for about five or 10 minutes before it can continue to work on it. Mm -hmm. But now that back is soft. Sometimes I do it a couple times just to make sure. Yeah. The last thing that would have happened is, is you put this into a wooden handle and you go to drill a hole through it and the drill bit doesn't want to cut. Yeah, <laughs> I've had that happen. <laughs> You've seen that so many times. Yep. But uh, by blowing it out and um, again, this is, if you heat it up to a red color mm -hmm. and you quench this, it'll become hardened. This is just removing the removing the hardness from bringing the temperature up to maybe eight, 900 degrees. Yeah. Uh, not red. I'm going to now grab this and I'm going to put it down so that the cutting edge, but not the whole thing, not the blued area is in the bucket. Sure. If I hit the blue area of the bucket, I'm going to do not good things to the steel. Yeah. But just the cutting edge, cause that's what I'm trying to protect. Mm-hmm. can bring it out, let the cut, let the, uh, water drip down to the cutting edge as long as i don't see it steaming or boiling on the cutting edge i know i'm not allowing it to uh draw out its hardness so not blue not in the water and you bring it back so the water drips down off the back of the cutting edge as mm -hmm. long as that's not steaming um steaming is probably I don't know what temperature water steams at, probably two, three hundred degrees or something. But as long as that's not boiling off the back here, I know that this is cool enough. And my thumbs tell me it's cool enough. Yeah. And it's getting hotter because the heat now is traveling through and coming down. Mm -hmm. So until the heat's out of the tang, I got to babysit this. Sure. So it doesn't creep around that corner. Because this is thinner than the Ricasso, mm -hmm. it acts like a heat sink. So you might not see, um, no, <laughs> it just wants to draw the heat out quicker. And I almost think she's getting where it's safe just to put it down. We've taken the blade that's been ground to 110 grit and we've blued the tang down halfway down the Ricasso, keeping this cool. And now this is softened enough so that later on when I go to drill a hole in it, I'll have no problems, otherwise, it's really a disaster when you got a piece of wood mounted to it and you're trying to put a hole through it and the drill bit skids and it damages your wood. If you look closely at this, you cannot see any pattern of Damascus. You cannot see any lines or inclusions. It's a perfectly clean piece of Damascus mm -hmm. that uh, the welds are all tight. Uh, and that is on both sides, mm -hmm. the spine. And I'm quite happy with the way this is coming out so far, this piece. We have the blade, it's 400 grit. It's a mm -hmm. nice finish. And now I want to sand this out to 800 grit. Um, I'm going to start off with 600. Uh, and I have this little fixture I made. So you got it to 400 now on the belt sander, right? Yep, I got a 400 on the belt sander. If it was a sloppy 400 on the belt sander, I would probably have to use um, uh, 400 on the hand sand to start with. Mm -hmm. But it's a pretty clean sanding. Um, so I'm going to go right to six. So this is just a piece of, of uh, 5160 stock. I mm -hmm. put some tape on it to protect the backside of the uh, blade because once one side gets finished, I don't want to scuff it up. 
Yeah. Uh, the blade is held down by my um, clamp. I use this clamp for filing corners, for holding stuff. Uh, it's just an oversized, overkilled uh, clamp made out of tool steel, hardened and tempered to 60. I'm going to cut myself some strips of 600. 600 grit paying attention to where my thumb is yeah I, please. Once, I once had a bad day and <laughs> i came across my thumb and that just ended the work day two stops ago uh we had a uh, young man cut himself pretty well yeah. and quit too. bending your thumb <laughs> I'm telling you, he's well you know you can't work around nice without getting cut just a few times huh? Yeah. A little duct tape <laughs> now we can put this up here and tape this <laughs> <laughs> this Keep is a good opportunity to go take a lunch break yeah if you don't want to get burnt or cut <laughs> uh, don't do this as a hobby or whatever. That's a fact. So I have a couple different sticks I use to, um, to sand with. I've got a hard back, I call it. Um, it's just a piece of steel. One is chamfered, one edge is pretty square. Yeah. Uh, I use that for flattening. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a soft back, which is from my son's Cub Scout days. When I had the troop over, we used to put sandpaper on this stick and we used to have them learn how to sharpen knives yeah. instead of buying them all stone. So we made um, this to have them to sharpen knives. Well, that's smart, yeah. So I've turned this into my soft back, which I'll put on here and I'll sand it. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to go with that first. I want to find all the high and low spots of this blade. Yeah. Um, it should be pretty easy because the blade's been ground relatively flat. So when you're sand hand sanding, there's this angle, uh -huh. this angle, mm -hmm. straight, sorry, straight, and drawing. Mm -hmm. Drawing is usually the final stage, but it doesn't have to be until you hit your final, uh, final paper, which is going to be the 800. Sure. I'm going to start off on the point. Now, all the lines go this way. Yeah. I'm trying to erase every line that I see. Big, yeah. small, it doesn't matter. It needs to come off. I'll see it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's no reason to move forward if you don't get them all. I, I do everything pretty much, well not everything, I do a lot of stuff under optics and uh, mm -hmm. this is a two and a half power uh, lens. The focal point's I think eight inches away, yeah. so that means I got to keep my head eight inches away. This blade is um, nicely flat. Ah, mm. see I see right here, I'm not sure if you can pick it up, but that is left over not 400 grit, that's probably 220 grit scratches right there. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to get rid of. Yeah. Come back the other direction, I'm gonna angle my sandpaper a tiny bit. Yeah, to lower the whole blade down, if there's a scratch in the middle, you gotta lower the whole blade down. Sure. But uh, if there's just a scratch, scratches on the edges, I just angle it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And part of that will get taken out during sharpening. I'm doing this dry so that you can see more of the pattern of the sanding that's going on but a lot of times i do it with a little wd-40 yeah on the blade it helps the uh, paper from getting clogged change the direction change the direction change the direction change the direction and the 220 scratches are now gone the more attention you pay to your grinding on your belt sander the less work this is. Mm. I've taken the blade, I've hand sanded to a real nice, clean um, 800 grit, going the long ways on the Ricasso and the blade. I've sanded the back, the spine, to 800 grit also. And the only thing I haven't sanded is the uh, underside of the Ricasso. So I'm going to take my little protector here, put this in the vise, in a hard back. Because under here has got a couple different grinds. And I want to make the grinds all one. Mm -hmm. 600 would take too long. 400 will go faster. Go faster. Roll the rubber around the side, bring this onto this bottom so I can go sand the floor and sand the back side of this all in one shot. So I'm grinding, I'm sanding this right here again and the floor at the same time by rolling the rubber, pushing the rubber around mm -hmm. and having that starting at the top of the cutting edge and running right down and going out the back. 
all the grains are one direction, all the lines are one direction, and the underside is sanded. Attention to, to small details like this is, um, well, what really I try to strive to put into my knives. So the next step is that we want to put a guard on this. I have blank guards. I've taken chunks of 416 stainless. I've gone to work and I've machined slots in them mm. to rough sizes to, to fit onto the blade. Yeah. So I've got these blocks in different sizes. When I don't have access to a mill, I'll drill holes and I'll connect them with a the file. Oh yeah. It's, yeah. it's labor intensive. It mm -hmm. probably takes me half hour, maybe a little more than that to do it. But on a milling machine, three axis mill, I can do that in five minutes. Yeah. It's so th this eventually has to get fitted onto this guard. Mm -hmm. But the first thing is, is that this is all sloppy. This is just belt sanding, belt sanding. Sure. And I want to um, move this guard. I want to move the guard forward to about there, mm -hmm. somewhere where that tape is. So I want to take and mark this. The top of the blade is at the ricasso is flat, so I'm pushing the blade against that. Um, I'll take a black marker. And I'm going to mark this line right here. Okay. Uh, in the beginning, I made ricassos that were too long. Mm -hmm. I barely, rarely made them too short. Somebody told me there's a ratio of like one to three. Yeah. So whatever distance this is, you have it three times as tall. Um, I'm not exactly sure, but I just know that I make mine smaller than I used to. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna take and now notch this metal out to come up to a square shoulder. Mm -hmm. So when I push the guard onto it, it's going to be up flush. Otherwise, you'll see gaps around the guard. Yeah, it'll be so flush against the shoulder. Sh yeah. Flush against the shoulder. So instead of filing that all away, I'm going to use the belt sander first off just to rough that in. So I moved out that chunk of metal right there with the belt sander. Mm -hmm. I kept this away from that surface because I was doing a blind. I was doing it from this side. Yeah. And I really didn't want to go past that. My clamp, mm -hmm. which doubles as a filing jig. This in over here. I usually reduce the thickness of the blade mm -hmm. right behind the Ricasso by five to 10 thousandths per side. Mm -hmm. So between 10 to 20 thousandths, this will be smaller. Yeah. So that when it slides up to the um, guard. You got that uh, shoulder there. Shoulder there, so the, any imperfections in the guard, if, especially if I do it by drilling and filing, mm -hmm. will be covered up by five or 10 thousandths worth of, of land Very there. Very cool. Um, so I'm gonna first measure out what I have here. I'm gonna grab my caliper. There she goes. All right. Yeah, I was I was cocking it, and I took took the high point off. Yeah. So I'm about six under. I'm just going to give it a few more strokes with a finer file. Mm -hmm. I finished filing these two shoulders in this width. Uh, this width is, and this height is close to the roughed out uh, slot I have in here that I did on a milling machine mm -hmm. at lunchtime. Um, I have access to mills so I can do that. If not, I would take and drill holes and file it as a square. So this guard has to go on and then get pushed up to the shoulder. Mm. Uh, but first off, I see that this face is pretty ugly. Yeah. So I'm gonna hit it with 400 just to start to refine that a little bit. blade has been filed and this mm -hmm. needs to fit up there. This is relatively close to the size of the tang. Yeah. Not perfect. So we want to find out the high spots where the 
it's come in contact with this. Um, I take a brass protector plate, mm -hmm. I'm going to put that over the top of this. I'm going to take a pusher plate. Uh, this is an easily made piece of brass with an oversized slot in it that has hole locations for different size guards or, um, on it. Mm -hmm. It has two screws. I only use one actually. And those two screws, uh, or the one screw, holds it to the tang. Put this on. Now you could start to see what this tool does. As I tighten this on, <coughs> and I screw the back screws in, can I use a protector plate because these screws will dig up the back of your guard. Oh yeah, yeah. And I start tightening these in. Well, that's brilliant. Yep. I picked this tool, this trick up from somebody. Yeah. I don't know who it is, but uh, every time people see it, they're saying, boy, that looks so easy. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm putting pressure on this thing and driving it over the interference fit. The more interference fit you have at the end, the more stable that guard will be. Yeah. Yes, I do use glue, but the glue is not meant to hold the guard on. Mm. The glue is meant to make a seal so moisture can't get in through the face of this. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but if you use uh, the glue and you use JB Weld, uh, <laughs> it's really tough to get it off between the pressure fit and the glue. Yeah. So this is slowly creeping up. If somebody wants to purchase one of these uh, little tools, where do they get this at? Um, this is just a homemade thing. Yeah. Um, if they had a chunk of, don't use aluminum, but a chunk of brass, possibly even steel. I'd steel, I think would work fine. Um, cut yourself a slot and put some 1032 holes in it. They can make themselves. Why I don't make them out of aluminum, aluminum doesn't seem to last as long. Yeah. And when I make them, I make a couple at a time. <laughs> Okay, so I've roughed in the guard over here, and the outside's been roughed in, and I want to refine the outside edge a little bit, start getting a better shape, uh, and putting a better finish on the inside here, taking a little bit more off the bottom. Less double grinds, uh, 110 finish, it's centered, a little bump right there, I'm going to touch that off. So what I have here is an etching system. and For your maker's mark. Where I'm, for my maker's mark, uh -huh. right. And I had stencils made, um, I believe the company's called IMG, mm -hmm. and the lady that I talked to many years ago is Patricia. If she's still there, thank you for the, thank you for the um, stencils. Okay, so I have two little cups here. Mm -hmm. The tall lip is always acid, so I don't get them confused. And the short little lid is neutralite, which will neutralize the acid that I um, put on the part. Uh -huh. I've got my stencils here, and I'm going to find out if my Lokides is going to Lukides is going to fit on this bolster, which it, get my visor. I don't want to have the S hanging off or the L <laughs> yeah. hanging off. No, it's, it's just, I think it's just too close. I'm going to see if I have a smaller one. Yeah, that works. Smaller stencil? The smaller stencil. Tape. Okay, presentation side of the blade. I like to make sure my Lukides is on the right side of the blade and not the wrong side. And I'm going to take this, dab it into the electrolyte, which takes the 
current coming through. Mm -hmm. and I splash off the extra, I always get too much on. It takes the current coming through and makes it transfer to the metal. This is gonna eat away the metal just a little bit. Bit of an acid etch. Acid etch, mm -hmm. and it goes on for about 45, got my ground on good, 45 seconds. I'll put, put this on. That wasn't supposed to shift, but we'll straighten that out in a minute. And I'm going to rock it back and forth a tiny bit. Ever so slightly. And that is a permanent etch. Oh, yeah. So no, it's, it's, I'm, it's cutting, I'm cutting into it. Yep. You could grind it off, mm -hmm. but it's not like a black overlay. Okay, so that was 45 seconds, give or take. But etching, actually, acid etches the surface. I'm hitting it with Neutralite. Mm -hmm. It is nice and deep on the first try. Excellent. Sometimes I go a second try if it's not deep enough. Yeah. And yeah, that's good. And that's the first side etched. So I just finished putting the label or my JS and my name on the knife. And one thing that I wanted to say about the way I work is, is that whatever you see me do works for me. Uh, if you see ways of improving it or not even using it, that's great. I, I just want to show you my methods and uh, take what you want, leave the rest. I'm going to clean this up and then we're going to acid etch the Damascus pattern into the blade. Yeah, that's what I've been That's always before. fun. The red on my hand is not blood. It's just paint off of my vice because I hit acetone on it. <laughs> but keep... give us time. Yeah, we will cut ourselves again. <laughs> Okay, you're on. Okay, so I have my blade. Uh, my name's etched into it. I lightly went over it with um, 800 grit again, just to clean it up. And now I want to etch it in ferric chloride mix, 20% ferric chloride to uh, water. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna first daub this real good with acetone. So you got to make sure it's any clean. oil on there is going to resist the the acid. Yeah. And um, I've seen other makers use this uh, detergent and mm -hmm. scrub it up really good. I like that too, but I don't have a sink down here, and I don't like running back and forth up and down stairs with sure. with blades. So and the rag is just out of the washing machine. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, there's no contaminants on it. Rub the dickens out of it. That's the blade cleaned up. Um, I'm going to grab my handy dandy vice grips, bring it over to the ferric chloride, and I'm going to put it into the ferric chloride. And I'm going to wait 10 to, I don't know, 10 minutes or so. How many etches do you do? Um, I am going to do two for sure, probably three. Hmm. Um, I added a little bit of water to that, and I think I changed my uh, dilution a tiny bit. Yeah. And when I did that, the last time I etched, it wasn't deep enough. Mm. So probably go three etchings, uh, three etchings. Okay, so the knife's been in there for a little bit more than 10 minutes in the acid. I'm gonna bring it out, and this is the first look. Look at that. That's the first look of the acid. Yeah, nice twist pattern. Look at the other side, probably a couple drops of acid on there. Mm -hmm. And nice contrast, Beautiful. that's all going to disappear. Okay, so that black pattern's still there. But in order to continue the etch and make it, in order to continue the etch to make it deeper, I need to um, remove that black. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to first try scrubbing with uh, 3000 grit. I'm going to see how that looks. That should be able to take it off. Sometimes if I'm going to use a coffee etchant afterwards, I'll even use stainless steel wool, a triple lot stainless steel. Rub that here back and forth. Again, this is 3000 grit versus the 800 I had put on there. This is the second time in the etchant for a little more than 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. I bring it back out, the colors back onto it and hopefully I burnt a pattern a little bit deeper into it. We're gonna go back into the acid one last time. Okay, so we're back from lunch 
and I had etched the blade three times. Um, now the blade is fully etched, and I've taken the guard that you saw me push on before, and I used JB Weld, which is a very good uh, uh, steel reinforced epoxy. And I, when I push this on, I use the epoxy around the tang to seal uh, the guard from any moisture creeping underneath it, which would end up leaching out back out and rusting the blade. Mm -hmm. So it's a sealant more than um, something to hold it on. Because um, you saw how much force it took to put that on with cranking the screws. It's on there solid. It's a press fit. It's a press fit. So that's, that's on there good. Um, the outside is still a tiny bit rough and the underside here is still a tiny bit rough. I'm gonna do that when we finish the, uh, the knife handle to the blade. So what I've done already is I prepped uh, one spacer to go on. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna take and I'm gonna scribe around the outside and that's gonna give me a line to grind to so I can make it so not, I don't have to grind so much when it's assembled. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna put several spacers back yep. behind that between the guard and the, the handle material. Yep, right? I'm using a copper, a copper spacer, mm -hmm. then a um, stainless steel spacer, mm -hmm. and then the last one here is another copper spacer that I haven't drilled out yet. Yeah. So I'll put it in the vise. I got a little oversized drill. I drilled N2 holes. I'm gonna drill one in the middle. So now I got three holes put in there and some burrs. Now the holes are connected. Flatten them out some. All right. So I have this and this now buttons up. Mm -hmm. And there's a little bump there keeping it from seating the whole way. Turn it around, see if it fits any better. There she goes, that's the way I want it. Okay, so the first one's marked with a one, the steel's marked with a one because there's only one piece of steel, mm -hmm. and I'll mark this with a two. And I mark it at the top because this fits better than that way. It yeah. fits better than that way, so it's all rotationally marked, and that goes on there. Okay, so the next step is now to rough these um, spaces into size. <laughs> This way, two coppers and one stainless bushing. Nice. And that's how you fit them up. I've taken this handle, I've taken the tang, and I put it onto this block of coca bolo mm -hmm. where I want it to go. I've taken and then scribed, I've traced the tang on the wood. Always good to have, <coughs> not to remove this lines because we're going to use it for um, later. Mm -hmm. uh, to we want to make sure that we don't cut into this pocket I drilled. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a, a mistake that people make. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to protect my Damascus blade, which is nicely etched. By notching this and holding the back here, it enables me to go over the guard grab the front of the, go over the blade, grab the front of the guard, and then apply pressure to the back. Pulls it all up together. Close it shut. Yep. Then I'll hold it up to the light, light's my good friend, and I see a little bit of gappage on the first ring. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna hold it up 90 degrees, and it's pretty good there. Uh, just gappage on the first ring. So on the very first spacer there, I see a, a light, small gap. Again, for you people that want to go after the nth degree, chase it down. You know, very little. And now that's where the two holes are going to go. Now the pin I'm going to be putting in this is a copper mosaic pin. Uh, you can't really see the detail on the end of it right yet. Mm -hmm. But it's an eighth inch diameter. So I need to poke a hole eighth inch here and an eighth inch here.
It fits. It goes right through. Yeah. It goes right through. Excellent. And actually it's snug. The very top is blown out a little bit, but we're going to be cutting it off enough metal yeah. that it's going to work out fine. So yep. here I'm going to pop the clamp off. And if I'm lucky, that is somewhere in the tang. <laughs> and I, I'm sure it is. Sure. Boy. Just made I it. I just made it. <laughs> oh, shoot. That's a little lower than I thought it was. But that's all right. That's planning it out is, is tough. Yeah. It's 300 worth of metal. Mm -hmm. So I do not want to, I do not want to grind any closer than 300 to, from the center, from the bottom of that pin to the bottom of the wood. When you're shaping the when handle. When I'm shaping the handle. Yeah. So otherwise it'll be into the tang and that'll blow out the whole yeah. project. Then. So in sawing, grinding, or working with Coco Bolo, my recommendation is, is that you always wear a mask. Uh, it's got uh, two reasons why you want to wear a mask is mm -hmm. one, there's uh, silica in the wood, which is a glass. And if you do a nice clean cut on the end with a table saw and hold it up to hard light, you'll see little, little glints of uh, glass in there. Mm. Uh, two, um, besides the glass, uh, it, there's maybe some allergen in there that some people get sensitized to the wood. And once they get sensitized to the wood, they won't be able to use the wood anymore unless mm -hmm. they want to put up with a lot of lung issues. You wouldn't happen to have an extra mask for me, would you? Yes, I do. Awesome. Rough profile. So I'm going to mix up a batch of 30-minute epoxy. I'm going to thin down the epoxy a tiny bit with some heat. Sometimes it makes it set, set quicker. Mm. But the pro is it becomes more water-like, more water-like, and you can pour it easier. Yeah. Oh, look at that. That's yeah. brilliant. So I put some yeah, epoxy right. down in there. I'm letting it settle. But uh -huh. while I'm letting it settle, again, it has that stick to create an air uh, place for the air to come out as it goes to the bottom. Sure. I'm going to take and start to put my spacers on. Everything has been wiped down with acetone mm. so that this is oil, oilish free. And put another layer of another spacer on. Make sure my dot is in the back to orient mm -hmm. it. I don't want to put them on backwards or upside no. down. So that's all set with epoxy. It's all one sloppy mess. Yeah, it is. Um, if it isn't sloppy and it's not a mess, you're not doing it right. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to come back here. Hit this with some more heat. Yeah, nice. Not too much, though. Not too much. Just It'll, enough. Epoxy creates heat when it um, starts to harden. Yeah. And if you cause it to heat, it's that's in there. All I can, the way in there. I can see that it's about a half inch from the top. Yeah. That means when I go to put this in, it oh, should yeah, overflow it everywhere. Now, on the side of the knife handle. There it goes. I have. Uh, oh. Perfect. Yep. There we go. I Perfect. Put some tape on this to keep it from leaking out the holes while mm -hmm. I was doing this whole whole thing. So I'm going to take the tape off the holes. Yep. I'm going to take the pins. Now I had a little problem trying to get the pins in earlier. Yeah. So even though it slid in nice when it was in the thing, it was a little tougher. Uh -huh. A little debris there. I'm coating the side of the pins with epoxy too. Oh, got it. Excellent. Good Half fit. the battle. Let's coat this with epoxy. I think most epoxies are like a 14 or 15,000 pounds sure weight or something crazy Ooh. like that once it cures. That I'm clueless on. It's a lot. Yep. Okay, a little detail that I do, mm -hmm. and I've seen other people not do it is I clock my pins. What that means is the pins are, when you look at the end of them, there's five dots in the center of the pin. Sure. I'm taking and I'm screwing it so that the one dot is straight up and it's not just randomly placed in there at different mm -hmm. locations. Okay, so I put on the tape there just to keep the block from getting loaded up with um, epoxy because uh -huh. it plugs my uh, wheels up. I've already Roughly, roughly profiled it. Uh, there's a ton more wood to come off of it. Sure. And uh, that's what the block is now. It's got its two mosaic pins. 
I've got my pathway where the um, uh, slot is on the side. I will make sure I do the bottom pretty much finished before I um, take this off because I'll lose where my tang is. Mm -hmm. But I did write a note that below the bottom of the hole is about 300 thousandths. And I, mm -hmm. have, I have pretty good confidence I'm not gonna come close to hitting that. Sure. So we're gonna take and put on a mask and turn red. Okay, so I roughed out the top. I really don't know my symmetry that well, whether or not I'm symmetrical or not. Okay, so now I have just tape on both sides. A couple different methods I use to check to see if the handle's in the center. Mm -hmm. One is like a poke test. I'll put it down on the blade like holding right here. That means it's sitting flat on this angle. Mm -hmm. I'll take and I'll poke the uh, a box of some sort. Oh, that's cool. And I see a mark. Uh -huh. If I flip this over and I come next to the mark. That should be in the same place. That's an easy way of doing it. Yep. Don't need to overcomplicate anything. That's I'll, awesome. show, I'll show you the complicated way in a second. Yeah. And then I'll put it on the back. I'll put a mark. And that's yeah. off that's maybe a, a sixteenth of an inch. Yep. It's about a thirty second off in the material on the back. Yep. So that is pretty symmetrical down the side of the blade. Sure. Neat little quick tip, uh, tip on how to do things. Yep. If you're into the more accurate stuff, uh -huh. um, on the drop gauge, it's about that number. Yep. Doesn't matter what number that is. I'm going to take it off. I'm going to flip it over. I'm going to bring it back. You want something pretty and close. And go back there. And it's about. 10, 20, 30, 40 thousandths mm -hmm. higher, higher on this side. That's not too shabby yeah. at all. Yeah, and that's then take a, this. Just a touch to the and belt, the, maybe there. Yep, that's all it is, especially yep. since it's a coarse belt. Yep. It's about 80, about that number there, whatever that number is. Yep. And I'm gonna bring this back down, and it's perfect. This is actually oh, centered. This beautiful. is off, this is about 40 thousandths off there. That's exceptional. So use. I don't know how you do that. That's. You're doing that all day long. You're doing that with everything. I don't know how you do that. Hey, Bob Gilchrist, <laughs> Bob Gilchrist. You gave this to me about 30 years ago, and I'm still using it to this day, making yep. great knives. <laughs> Bob's my brother-in-law, and he gave that yep. to me. And I tell you, I've, I've used it at work. I've used it at home. Now it's back at home, and uh, I'll have the company buy one if I need one that, sure. that great at work. The advantages of being a tool maker. Yep. I look at things not the way normal people look at them, but that doesn't mean you have to do it my way. Yeah. Take the easy stuff or improve on the hard stuff and let me know. Yeah. Or let Richard know and he'll tell me. Hey, hey. Put, it, put it down below in the notes. Yeah. You know, I make mean, a comment down below. I'm willing to learn from anybody. Absolutely. And well, I know you'll be looking at the comments. I will be looking at the comments. I'll be sure. looking at the comments. So leave a bunch of comments. It's the way that we know that you watch the video and actually care. I want this here to be about the same height as the Ricasso. Yeah. Careful, don't mark anything with your knife. Bring it up. It's just about perfect. So I have to make that smooth and like that. So again, this looks like crap, but uh, I'll improve on that in a minute. <laughs> At this point here, we're going to go to a little hand sanding in my uh, vise. I think I'm going to touch up this back edge first. Okay, so I've taken the uh, handle and I sanded on the machine till I got to 
oh, it's 400 grit. And now I'm gonna jump to um, 1,000 grit, which is pretty a pretty steep jump, mm -hmm. just to finalize the uh, handle, make sure I got most of the bumps out uh, before I go to the buffer to, to buff out the handle. Mm -hmm. So this is 1,000 grit. I'm using a uh, soft back, uh, which is a rubber, neoprene rubber uh, roofing material or inner tube of a tire on a piece of plywood that's been nailed on there. So I'm hitting with a thousand grit, looking for bumps, looking for scratches. Uh, you can actually use lesser or lower grits than a thousand, but my I seem to find that the higher the grit I go, the less buffing I gotta do. The less buffing I gotta do, the nicer the finish. I'm gonna tape that up. Um, my my uh, knife vise here is not something you pick up at any store, but it's actually the column off a drill press. Just imagine this standing up. This was the column holding the post of a drill press, and I made an adapter for it, and I made some jaws for it. And again, I'm a scavenger, so I made my own rotary vise. It weighs about 20 pounds, so you get exercise just lifting it. Okay, now I'm going to go to the pink nose scratch and put a polish on it. Okay, so I'm not sure if you can get how glossy that is, but that's a piece of Coca Bola rosewood that's been sanded to a thousand grit and mm -hmm. then buffed out. There's no finish on this whatsoever other than buffing compound that uh, made it shine up. Um, mm. I love the rosewoods because of that. I'm not a, a person that likes to put lacquers or urethanes on knife handles. And I got a little compound rubbed out of there. Sometimes the compound sticks, but that's it besides stripping it off and cleaning it up. So that's about it for us. I'm here with David Lucides, Cheshire, Connecticut. Brought me back home to Connecticut. I really appreciate that. You know, it's beautiful out here. We've worked all day long today and yesterday so we could bring you this great content. Make sure that you give us a hand by giving us a thumbs up and going down below and hitting subscribe. Hit the bell, press all, so you can get notified when we have new, uh, new videos out. Also, go to our website and buy a little something. It doesn't have to be expensive, just a little something because you going to the website and purchasing something is what allows me to stay out here and bring this great content to you. David, we had a good time. We did, it was exhausting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, we did a lot of, I did a lot of sweating and we did a lot of working and uh, uh, ultimately we produced a really, really nice hunting knife. That's a beautiful knife in two days. That's a beautiful knife. Yeah. And it's amazing we were able to get that punched out. Yeah, I mean, normally by myself, it's a 12 hour project. And mm -hmm. uh, to add all of the uh, filming, it takes some time. But they wanna get in touch with you, we're gonna put your information down below so that you can go to his website and buy some knives directly from him and his contact, your contact information, we should have that as well. Yep, yep, um, we'll put it, we'll, I'll give it to you later, we'll put All it right. on the site. But All if right. you get to www.prayerknives.com, uh, you will see uh, pictures of my chef knives and my custom pieces. Um, and uh, a lot of them are not available. This is just a showcase of what I can make. Some are available. If it says available under, under it, contact me. If you saw it in the video on the table today, it's available. Uh, my stock changes constantly. Right. So, and it's, by the way, it's 2023 October. So you may be seeing this two years down the road. <laughs> right now, yes, there are some true. knives available. And as you go full time, more full time, you're gonna have more knives available. Oh, for sure. It's always gonna be changing. Let's face it, it's custom knives, so it changes every day. Yeah, with the pricing I meant was for this lot. Once mm -hmm. it's gone, then I'm gonna reevaluate my pricing. As we do. Yes, we do. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Until next time, we'll see you then. 
I make this look good, don't I? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is Stylish. definitely me. Stylish masks. I, yeah, I should do this more often. All right. It's all you. I've had my fun. <laughs>